All right. Hello, everybody. Give them just a moment to uh, get settled here. Um, hi, I'm Josh Simmons. I'm with the Google Open Source Outreach Team and with the Open Source Initiative. And today I'm here to talk about uh, learning by doing. So learning how to build software, learning how to build interfaces, learning how to write documentation through contributions to open source. So a little about me. Uh, I am a web developer. I uh, spent about 10 years doing freelance web development, uh, ran a small agency, ran a startup into the ground, as one does. Um, and then I worked as a community manager and now uh, am at Google. And one of the things that I did for many years is I, I built Drupal and WordPress websites. So I was a site builder and did some level of glue to make, make these applications work. So most of my development was, was glue and nobody really needed to, uh, nobody else needed to work on these projects. So I didn't use version control. I didn't have tests. Uh, accessibility, uh, not a great, great track record. Uh, security, also not a great track record. And so for m the majority of my career, the development that I did was sort of in isolation and not of a great quality. It got the job done, but certainly wouldn't pass muster uh, if I were trying to work in a team or make a contribution to an open source project. So in 2012, after my startup uh, laid me off, I spent some time contributing to open source for the first time. So while for many years I had been using open source software because it's the tools of the trade, I hadn't really been contributing to open source software. So what I did is I built a very simple Drupal module. And I have to say, the learning experience was incredible. Uh, never had I been held to the level of standards that other developers expect a person to code to. So for many years, while I learned little bits at a time and I could do development, I was not a very good developer, basically. And so since I've started contributing to open source, I've learned a lot and very quickly. So the whole, that's, that's the thesis behind this talk, is that a person can learn rapidly by getting real world exper experience while contributing to open source software. So my hope with this talk is that for educators, for project leads, for people who are interested in mentoring people and growing the, the free and open source software community, um, that you'll all leave here with a sense of resources um, and some things that you can provide to students or just junior developers or people interested in getting into the industry. Um, you can provide them with resources for, for doing that and learning while getting their hands dirty. So um, there are a lot of resources that, oh, I should say, that's where to find me. My Twitter handle is somewhere on that slide. There's a hashtag in case anybody cares to tweet about this talk. Um, I gave a talk similar to this at PyCon AU and tweeted a bunch of resources using that hashtag, so you can find those links there. Um, but the slides are available at that link, uh, so you can revisit it later if you need that. So why? Why should people learn through open source? Uh, well, there's my experience. And then there's the experience that I, the stories that I hear through uh, my work on the Google Open Source Outreach Team. So we run, for instance, Google Summer of Code. And we run Google Coding. And these are programs where we partner open source projects with students so that the students can learn uh, while contributing to open source. So they're getting their hands dirty, they've got mentors to support them through the process, and in the end, they have real world experience, they've been, uh, they've been exposed to what it's, like, what it's like to actually work on a team and produce more or less professional quality results. So first, I wanna go over some programs um, that are you know, structured programs that students and other people can participate in to learn while contributing to open source. First, there's Coder Dojo. Now, this isn't necessarily specific to open source, but it's just so pervasive uh, and, and so well established that I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. Uh, Coder Dojo, last I checked, they had like over 100 chapters in uh, Australia alone. And so this is an opportunity for 
Uh, these are like physical in-person clubs for young people to get their hands uh, hands on with technology. Of course, there is Google Summer of Code and Google Coden, which are the programs that, that I work on. A little about these programs. Uh, Google Summer of Code has been running for 14 years, or we're going into our 14th year. Uh, over that time period, over 13,000 students have worked with over 600 open source projects, I want to say, producing, yes, I know lines of code isn't a great metric, but producing over 30 million lines of code, which is just kind of astonishing. Uh, the Google Summer of Code program is for students 18 and up who are, part, uh, who are in university programs. And the students work with a mentor from about May to August to uh, build some sort of project as a contribution to open source. Um, and students are paid a stipend for their participation in these programs, which is really helpful uh, insofar as it allows them to focus on their work on these projects rather than having to worry about juggling that and like a part-time job. Google Coden is a newer program. It's, I think, going into its eighth year now. And Google Coden is focused on teenagers from ages 13 to 17. Um, and it's structured as a contest. So rather than applying to it and being paid, uh, these students can select from a number of tasks that these open source projects uh, define. Tasks go from, include things like graphic design, uh, quality assurance, user research, um, outreach, um, development, writing, all of the above. And so students can find projects that they're interested, tasks that they're interested in, uh, tasks that they think they can accomplish, and tasks that challenge them and stretch their skills and they can use those to learn as they go through the program. I'll note that Google Summer of Code is summer in the northern hemisphere. Uh, so that may be challenging to students in Australia and the Southern Hemisphere and, and their, their schedules, but there are students who still do it, and I would encourage you to, uh, uh, to check that out. Right now, we're accepting applications from open source organizations. We'll be announcing those uh, in the next month, I believe, and students can apply in March. Google Coding, we just wrapped up. And that runs from mid-November to mid-January every year. Another program, Outreachy. Outreachy is very much inspired by Google Summer of Code. Uh, Outreachy, however, focuses on uh, underrepresented people in the industry. So Outreachy uh, was founded specifically to bring women into technology. Um, however, now in places like the US, they are also uh, bringing uh, racial minorities into the program, racial and ethnic minorities. And the, uh, it, it's structured very similar to Google Summer of Code insofar as there's a period of time that they're working on a project, they have support, um, and, it's, and, and, and it's paid. Another program probably inspired by Google Summer of Code. It turns out that there are a lot of programs who have used this as, a, as inspiration. Um, Rails Girl Summer of Code isn't necessarily specific to Rails. Uh, Rails, of course, being Ruby on Rails, the, the web framework. Um, it's also different insofar as people work on, as teams, teams of two on projects. Um, some of them are paid, some of them are not. Now, before I move on to issue tags, I just want to say that structured programs are a really useful way for somebody to get experience contributing to open source um, when they really don't know where to start. If they are starting from zero and they're not comfortable with uh, technology or they're just sort of paralyzed by all the options in front of them, these structured programs are a great way to pair them with a mentor, give them a set of options that um, they can wrap their mind around. And, and after that, you know, they, can, they can sort of take a self-guided approach to learning and contributing to open source. Issue tags are another great way for people to find um, find things to work on. So issue tags are things that are used to, uh, like labels that are put on issues and projects. So for instance, um, a project might have uh, documentation and somebody opens a bug uh, and th they open a bug because there's a problem in that documentation. And they might put 
an issue tag that says first timers only or beginners welcome or something along those lines. And so you can use issue tags to identify tasks that are newbie friendly, that are great for people who are new to a project or new to the technology, um, a way for them just to get started. And I'll say also that issue tags um, are a great way to, to just do something small and bite-sized to get one's hands dirty so that they get comfortable in a community and with a project and they understand what processes that project uses. Um, I can say that when I first contributed to open source, it was super intimidating. There's like a serious process for accepting contributions and, and, uh, and vetting them. And so even if somebody is comfortable with the technologies, they may not be comfortable with the processes. So finding a entry level task is a great way to learn one thing at a time, learn the processes, and then use their skills and the technology uh, in that project. So there are a lot of issue tags. I'm going to share uh, a few resources that aggregate issue issues that are for first timers. There is first timers only on Twitter. There is a website that goes along with that. They aggregate issues from GitHub that uh, have tags that are known to be targeted at first timers. There is your first pull request. Another, uh, another Twitter handle, also a, a website to go along with that. Um, both of these resources will aggregate issue tags that are great starting points. So whether it's you or a student or somebody you know who wants to get started, these might be great resources to point them at so that they can find a, a place to start. And upforgrabs.net. Uh, this is another resource that will aggregate issues uh, for people to get started with. So some projects are more newbie friendly than others. And I want to call out a few specific projects that I know to be uh, welcoming, uh, that I know to have a great mentorship program, and to be really uh, really ideal for people who are, are, are new to the industry or new, new to the community. First up, Beware. Uh, Beware is, well, first I'll say Beware is really cool. Uh, Beware is basically allowing people to use Python all of the places. So you can use Python to develop native web apps uh, or native applications on mobile. Uh, you can use Python in the browser. Um, so if you ever thought like isomorphic JavaScript was cool, Beware, also very cool. It's also a super welcoming community. They are really keen to, uh, anybody who's interested in contributing, they will often, they'll do everything they can to help that person get involved and make their first contribution to open source or their project in particular. Uh, Beware is also represented here at LCA. Uh, they're, the project maintainers are here and I'm sure they would love to talk to you if you're interested in, in connecting with them. Habitica. Uh, is a RPG for building better habits. Uh, I think it's based on mobile phones. It's a mobile phone app. Also a super welcoming community. They're great at bringing new people in. And also it's just kind of a cool tool, right? Um, then there's Hoodie. Hoodie is a framework that makes it easier to build uh, offline functionality into web applications. Also, Super welcoming. You'll see them often at sprints. Um, and then there's Public Lab. Public Lab is a yet another uh, really cool project that basically gets, um, it encourages citizen, citizen science. Um, and they have all manner of projects under that umbrella. Um, highly recommend it. Tim Videos, personal favorite. Uh, Tim, video, Tim Mithro, uh, Ansel, who is the, the Tim behind Tim Videos, is here at this conference. He's currently running the FPGA mini conf, um, which I'm pretty sure is sold out because it always is. It's awesome. Um, and the reason that LCA can record and stream talks so quickly, not only because these people right here working the video cameras are excellent, but also because Tim Videos has created software, free and open source software and hardware to support the recording and streaming of a video. It's 
it's basically magic. Um, I used it at a conference I ran recently, and it made it so much easier, regardless of. Yeah, I'm going to stop gushing about Tim videos because I could go all day about that. But I highly recommend checking it out. It's a wonderful project. Tim's here at this conference. So what's this about? There are a lot of other really welcoming projects that are great for newcomers. And what I like to do to find those projects is see who has been involved with programs like Google Summer of Code, Google Coden, and Outreachy. Because the reality is, is if a project has participated in one of these programs, they have necessarily structured themselves and evolved such that they're welcoming for newcomers. They've thought hard about what it means to be new to their project and what types of projects and processes and mentorship and support are needed to bring those people on board. So you can bet that if a project has ever participated in one of these programs, they're probably going to be better than average at welcoming newcomers. So a little more about why I'm recommending these projects and about what makes a project particularly welcoming and good for newcomers. Documentation, documentation, documentation. Cannot emphasize it enough. Documentation for users so people know how to actually use the thing. Documentation for contributors so that they know how to help. And this is really critical. Uh, the better your docs, the more time you spend on your docs, the less time you spend answering basic questions in IRC. You'll still get those basic questions, but you can at least point them to a link with the answers. Um, documentation is one of, the most, one of the most effective multipliers for making it easy to, it, it just helps your project scale as you build that community. Um, and so these are two common traits. If a project has documentation for users and for contributors, tends to be better than average at bringing new people on board. Gratitude. There's a lot to be said for the culture of a, of a project and the community around a project. Um, projects that I've recommended tend to be welcoming and gracious and thankful. Uh, even if somebody opens an issue or asks a very basic question, now none of those projects are going to say RTFM, read the damn manual. They're going to say, hey, we have a resource for this. We have answers, and let us help you. Um, so, and, and they will thank people just for opening the issue or asking the question, because that's expressing interest in being a part of the community. You know, a, a community that instead uh, just drops a link in the response and says nothing, or just says go away, or you know, whatever, the person's not going to come back. It's, this person's coming here, they want to help, they want to use your software, so you know, be, be gracious with these people, be kind. Responsiveness. Now this can be really challenging because open source is people and people have lives outside of open source. Um, oftentimes open source maintainers are like, pretty heavily burdened with the responsibilities of maintaining their project, of reviewing pull requests, of um, you know, making decisions, uh, arbitrating things in the community. But responsiveness is really important. You know, if an issue or a comment is, is there, waiting there for days or weeks and never gets a response, that, that contributor is going to go away. So that's another really good trait to look for. Code of conduct is super important. Codes of conduct are not just for conferences and meetups, they're also for projects. Um, codes of conduct help define the happy, uh, you know, define what professional and uh, good behavior is in context of a project. And they're critical because everybody comes from a different background. Whether that's your family, your culture, you know, whatever it is, everybody has a different idea of what's acceptable. And so codes of conduct just make it super clear. Like, this is okay, this is not, this is what will happen if you behave in the wrong way. So a code of conduct is a way to make sure that a community has a resource to fall back on when someone goes afoul, or runs afoul of, of those, those norms. A community that has put thought into writing a code of conduct has probably uh, the kind of community that's going to be welcoming and be better on these other, these other things. And mentorship. All of these things are sort of inter, interrelated. Um, a project that, all, all of the projects I highlighted really take mentorship seriously. Um, so 
these are things that you can look for when you're examining an open source project and wondering whether you should recommend it to somebody. Of course, friendliness. I touched on that when I was talking about gratitude. Just be nice. Like, people, this is a community of people. Uh, it's really easy to get caught up in getting things done and saying like, no, 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 this is wrong. This is not the way to do it. And it's so easy for that to be a negative experience for people. So just make a little extra effort to be friendly. You know, we all know that text is a challenging medium and an, an email that is in a neutral tone is going to be received as maybe probably negative rather than positive. So just making an extra step uh, to be friendly can be really, really helpful for bringing new people in. So I've shared a lot of resources, a lot of programs, a little bit about issue tags and projects, um, the, the characteristics that make a project welcoming and ideal for newcomers. There are a lot of other great resources. And I want to highlight, for instance, opensource.com. Opensource.com uh, is a uh, media outlet that is run uh, backed by Red Hat. Uh, great, say, great place to find open source news. They also have like Open Source 101, a lot of guides there that I, I highly recommend. Opensource.guide is a much newer project that is uh, started by GitHub, but is not necessarily owned by GitHub. It's an open source project unto itself has guides on how to create a welcoming community, or how to start an open source project, or how to contribute to open source. So opensource.guide is a useful resource, no matter a person's role with respect to, to open source. And teachingopensource.org is a project specifically for instructors, particularly at universities, uh, to collaborate on building curriculum, building open source into their curriculum, and they have a, a special focus on humanitarian, free, and open source software, so that while students are contributing to open source, not only are they contributing to the commons so that everybody benefits, not only are they getting real world experience in the process, but they're making the whole world a better place because these are projects that are uh, helping with medical record systems in developing nations, or they're microfinance in developing nations. Can't recommend that resource enough. So, that's all the content I have for you today. Um, I'm happy to take a few questions. And of course, you can find me online. I'm happy to, uh, happy to talk anytime. Thank you. Questions? questions. Ah, yes, of course. It's way back there. There it is. You're most welcome. <coughs> right. Sure, so the question is uh, about Google Coden and how it differs from Google Summer of Code. Google Coden is, uh, well, Google Summer of Code is for university students 18 and up and runs in the Australian winter, Northern Hemisphere summer. Um, for Google Summer of Code, a student will create a project application. They will apply with a particular project idea in mind and then the open source projects will look at those applications, and then they'll choose, choose a few, and they'll work on those over, over that, uh, that throughout the program. Google Coding is different insofar as it's for students ages 13 to 17, so for pre-university students. Um, and as you noted, it runs uh, during the Australian summer. It runs from November to um, January. Google Coding is also structured as a contest rather than um, rather than like a, a it's structured as a contest where students work on tasks. So right this year, there were 25 open source projects, open source organizations that were part of Google Coding. Each of them created hundreds, if not more, uh, tasks that are like bite-sized tasks that a student can work on. Um, there are beginner tasks even to help students just get started. So for instance, there is a uh, there might be tasks about setting up your development environment or just getting the software installed to start with. Um, 
then the tasks that they can work on range from uh, coding to quality assurance to graphic design to outreach to, uh, you know, it's, it's like all of the things. It's not just code. Um, and then students have between like three and seven days to complete each task. And if they need more time, a mentor can give them time. And I just mentioned mentor. This is really critical to both of the programs. Open source projects apply to participate in these programs. And then mentors support the students through those projects and through those tasks. So these students aren't like, we're not just throwing these students in the deep end and hoping they figure it out. But they actually have mentors there who are experienced contributors with those projects and who are, um, have, have an incredible amount of patience to work with uh, young students who you know, may be very new to this. Um, so Google Coding uh, is, like I said, run as a contest. At the end of the program, every organization chooses uh, two grand prize winners. And those grand prize winners, uh, we fly them out to Northern California for, for, to Google headquarters to meet their mentors, to meet each other, for, uh, to see talks from Google engineers and meet Google engineers. And since they're Northern California, we take them for like a day out in San Francisco for, for some adventure. Um, you know, we, we want to really reward these students and encourage them to contribute, continue contributing to FOSS. Um, so we, we try to give them some good incentives. Absolutely. Um, and, and what we find is a lot of students will, uh, these days, a lot of students will discover Google Code in, and they'll do that until they're too old for it, and then they'll do Google Summer of Code. And by the time they've done both of those programs, you know, they're, they're, they're an old hand at contributing to open source, and they've stretched themselves, and they've learned a lot of skills in the process. Um, so yeah, I, I highly encourage people to check out Google Code, and I think, as you noted, the timing works out even better for, for people who are in Australia. Yeah, you're welcome. See how how are we on time? Oh, we're we're fine. Okay. Any last questions? So the, the question is, uh, is, is about, uh, you know, a lot of things that I'm mentioning here sort of assume some level of experience or familiarity such that a person even knows what kind of projects they, they want to work on. Um, they have some background in these things. Um, often they're more tailored for high school or university students. So the question is, what, what are the options for, for younger students who may be brand new? Uh, maybe they've just graduated from, from working with Scratch, for instance. And the answer? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, so I mentioned Coder Dojo. Yeah, right. So, there, so there's probably more about that today. Uh, yesterday morning in, in the opening, that the charity that the conference is sponsoring is Code Club Australia, I believe. And I got the sense that that is for younger students. Uh, OK. OK. This, this, this gap here, right, between, there's a gap sort of between the scratch and the, uh, the, the Google code in, you know, and the, uh, and their, the preteen years or what have you. Uh, I think that might be where Coder, Coder Dojo really comes in. Uh, and I, 
I haven't looked at how many there are around, how many chapters there are around Sydney. Really, not many around Sydney. Okay, code clubs. Okay. 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 So it sounds like, uh, just to, to summarize the discussion from the audiences, it sounds like there's not a whole lot of coder, uh, coder dojos in this area. It sounds like um, there are not a whole lot of opportunities for these younger students who have maybe uh, experience with Scratch, but you know, they're not necessarily ready for Google coding or whatever those next steps are. Um, I would happy, I'd love to take that question offline and see if I can find some resources. and. Uh, and if there really is a gap, then maybe we just need to find the right people to, to light those fires. <laughs> so, okay. So I'm, so I'm going to summarize just real briefly, and then we'll wrap up here. Um, Nick in the back mentioned that uh, not even universities do a great job of teaching students how to collaborate. And I have to say, this is one of the most, this is one of the reasons that I'm, I'm kind of like, I've drank the Kool-Aid, I'm, I'm like a true believer in learning by contributing to open source, is that that forces people to work in a team, right? And it not only forces them to work in a team, it forces them to write code that can be, or, or, or make contributions that are part of a greater project, makes them work with people across time zones, makes them learn how to use version control, do make, write tests, things like that. So really, like, contributing to open source is a great way to learn and stretch oneself once, one has some of the skill, once a person has some of the skills um, and get real world experience such that by the time they get out of university and they're looking for jobs, they know what they're doing. You know, not, every, not all of their experience has been creating projects in a sandbox for an assignment and then moving on to the next thing. They're actually contributing to something that hundreds, thousands, millions of people might be using. And they can, because it's open source, they can put it on their resume and, and people can look at the code or their contributions to these projects. Um, anywho, I could gush about this for a long time and I would love to talk to people, talk to people in the hallway. I'll be at the conference all week. Um, uh, but I think, I think it's about time for lunch. So thank you very much.